Hi, good uh, morning, everybody. Uh, so this uh, talk is indeed called uh, How to Create a Vegan World, and that's the title of my book, uh, How to Create a Vegan World. And uh, it's been called a book that everyone should avoid by the vegan police. And uh, this is an actual quote. I didn't invent this. This is actually somebody calling himself the vegan police. Uh, but what I want to show with this is that um, I'm sometimes a bit of a devil's advocate within the movement. And some people would just simply say I'm the devil. Um, but uh, so before I give some of my perceptions about the vegan movement and what we can do better, let me just say um, very simply that I think that vegans, of course, are awesome. I was, um, yeah, yeah. In the, U in the United States, where I just was at the conference, we would say like, "Give yourself a big round of applause." <laughs> We're not going to do that here. So um, vegans are awesome. Why? Because you have to deal with a lot of shit. You are swimming against the stream. You're doing a thing that's really awesome. That's really great, that has so many benefits for so many things, and you're doing it in spite of the fact that 97% of the people or something is against you and is criticizing you and ridiculing you. So that's why it's really recommendable to be vegan, of course. So that being said, let me explain some things about what we could do better. In my book, I uh, use a metaphor. I use a metaphor of the trek to Veganville. Uh, a hike to Veganville. Veganville is the village where we want everybody to live. We want everybody to live in that village to be vegan. We want a vegan world, right? And um, I have um, subdivided the book in different, part, uh, different chapters. It's about, the first one is about getting your bearings. Where are we? The second one is about the call to action. What are we ideally going to ask people to do? The third one is about motivations. What are the arguments we're going to use? Then the environment is about like how do we create an environment that's facilitating people's evolution. Then I have a big chapter on communication. How do we communicate best with people, like in an engaging way that like really motivates and stimulates them. And then finally there's a chapter on sustainability, about how to keep on doing what we're doing both as vegans and as activists. But today I'm going to talk about another metaphor, and I'm going to use the metaphor of ingredients. And I'm going to talk about four ingredients that we need for a vegan world. Four things that we need more of in our movement. And you can think more than four, of more than four things, but I'm going to just discuss these ones. Open-mindedness, empathy, rationality, and positivity. Those are the four ingredients that I see that we can use some more of. So let's start with open-mindedness. If you're like me, you were, for a certain part of your life, you were in a certain box. We could call it the box of carnism. It's an ideological box, and it made you think that, like Melanie Joyce says, meat-eating is normal, natural, necessary. You were just inside your safe box, and you were okay there. But then all of a sudden, you get a bit you see the box move, get a bit restless inside the box, and then the light goes on, the box opens, and you jump out <laughs> as a vegan, right? And you start talking about all these things, and you start realizing all these things, these, uh, what, what meat eating or animal products consumption is connected to, environment, health, and so on. And then what happened to me is that I found that I was um, all of a sudden finding myself, to a certain extent, in another box, in the box of veganism. And I was um, noticing with myself that I wasn't listening very much anymore to others, to non-vegans, and I was thinking I had found the truth and I was just repeating the same things all the time. So I was saying things like, veganism is this, and you're not vegan if you, are, if you do that, and vegans are that. Like all kinds of things that were a given to me, that were like, that I wasn't questioning anymore. So, for instance, this cartoon illustrates it very well, like, if there's, so I'm, mo I'm mostly vegan, but, and the other, the other person here says, there's no, you're, you're not vegan if there's a but, right? So there was no questioning anymore. And I, I agreed with this, and I don't think today that's a good thing. And I was always also going back, like I see many people do, going back to the definition of veganism. This guy, Donald Watson, invented veganism so many years ago, and we go back to his definition and his, and that's, that's a bit like a religion, like going back to the original scripture. And, and um, I found myself doing that again and again. And here is a good test. 
like to see, to check your open-mindedness. This is an article, actually, I, th I thought it was a pretty good article. Why vegetarians or vegans should be prepared to bend their own rules. How do you feel about reading this title? Are you motivated to read this article or are you saying like, I'm go not gonna read that shit? <laughs> you know, that's how you can test your own open-mindedness. Or can you imagine that maybe it's a little bit more complicated than this? Maybe this serves for purposes of external communication, but when we think about it, it may be a little bit more complicated. So what I wanna say is um, you can be liberated from the carnist box, but you can end up in another box. And just let me be clear, if you're in a box, it's much better to be in this box than this box, <laughs> okay? But still, it's better to be not inside any box at all. And the way I put it sometimes is being vegan means giving up animal products. It doesn't mean giving up thinking. So beware of dogma. What's wrong? Dogma is like not questioning things anymore, taking things for granted. And what's the problem with dogma is that dogma doesn't allow ourselves to improve. Okay, and we have to constantly improve because there's so much work to do and we have to get ever better at it, okay? So open-mindedness, these things can help you. Like think about questions like, have I thought about this thoroughly? Have I really thought about this? Or am I just repeating something that I've heard all the time? Think about what information you might be missing. Think about what your own biases are when you talk to people, etc. And I, I, I say it like this, practice slow opinion. Slow opinion is about being slow in forming an opinion. Not like on Facebook, like right away saying like, it's like this and I think like this, I think this or that, no, just take a break and think like, maybe I haven't thought this through, maybe I need to think about this a little longer. And you say like, for now I have no opinion. Or this is my preliminary opinion, and it may change later, okay? That's how you, I think, practice open-mindedness. The second one is empathy. And um, we are, as, a, as vegans, we are typically very good at empathy. This is Anita Krejcik, I, I never know how to pronounce the name. Uh, the woman who started the SAVE movement in the Toronto and she's feeding, she, or she's watering a pig here. I think it's a very nice symbol or icon of empathy. And um, like I said, we're, um, oops, yeah. We're very good at empathy, um, especially for these pigs and these cows and these um, um, chickens. But we're not so good as empathy for meat eaters or for hunters, or for bullfighters, you know? So you could say, really, do, you need, do we really need empathy for these people? You know, like, seriously? <laughs> so I take Gary Yurovsky here as, a, as an example of somebody who's like really in your face and who doesn't really um, take reactions of the people he's um, talking to that much into account. He just says it like straight like it is. Um, and um, there's this, I mean, on the opposite side of Gary Yurovsky, you have something, somebody like Thich Nhat Hanh, do you know him? He's like a Vietnamese Buddhist monk, and he's vegan, and he's spreading veganism. He's almost, he's, he won't be with us very long, he's, uh, he's very sick. Um, he's a wonderful person, he's very compassionate, he's like a monk, he's like very zen, and he won't like scream in your face, etc. I'm not saying either one of these approaches is the right approach. I'm saying like for myself, I choose usually a more soft, a more calmer approach, and I think it is actually applicable and appropriate or useful in almost any situation. And I can imagine that there's people thinking here like, oh, there's definitely some people we don't need empathy for. People who are really, really not nice. Can you think of some people like that? They were recently in the news. These people, right? Do we need empathy for them? Well, I think it might be useful. And I just want to illustrate with this guy. This is Daryl Davis. He's a black guy. And he, um, he grew up outside of America and he came back um, to America when he was 10 and he had no experience with racism whatsoever. And uh, he was walking into a march and he was the only black kid and all of a sudden people were throwing things at him. It was in the 1960s or 70s. Throwing cans and bottles and, and bricks at him. And he, he just didn't understand. He said, what is this about? And uh, he found out about racism. And he wondered, like, how can these people hate me 
if they don't even know me. And what he did was he went to Ku Klux Klan people and he befriended them and he spoke to them and he listened to them. And he was open to them and he showed empathy towards them. And the result was that he was able to get 200 people outside of the Ku Klux Klan. He, he got them to give them their capes, their robes to them, to him, and they left the Klan. So empathy worked for him. He's uh, actually, this is a documentary about him on Netflix if you want to see that. So I think empathy or compassion and listening is never out of place. So it's about having an open mind, listening to people, asking questions. It's about building a relationship. I think this is one of the most important things we can do if we want to influence other people is to build a relationship with them. It's not to accuse them, not to guilt trip them, not to like show no empathy for them, but build a relationship trying to understand them. So to be mo some tips to be more empathetic, empath empathic. You, can under you can try to understand the situation we are in. So some people know this, uh, this quote from me, why do most people eat meat? Mo most people eat meat because most people eat meat, right? So this is a situation, we're in a situation where we're doing what everybody else does and it's quite a, kind of understandable that people are doing the wrong thing when so many people are doing the wrong thing. So that's, that's a situation or a condition we have to take into account. And you have to realize that to a certain extent, you are special. This is the adoption of innovation curve or model and it divides people into, into different sections from innovators to laggards. So for instance, if you had a smartphone 15 years ago already, you were an early adopter or an innovator. If you still don't have a smartphone, you're like on that end, okay? Um, and that's the way it is, it's going to be with, with vegans and with meat eating, with animal products consumption too. You are the early adopters and other people come later into the game. And to a certain extent, we can say that you or we are the low hanging fruit the low-hanging fruit in the sense that it was easy to reach us. It was easy to reach us with these moral arguments. We heard about animal suffering and more or less rapidly we went vegan. With other people it's not like that. They need more than just moral arguments. So understand that you're not the same as other people. Secondly, understand when you are dealing with people that you don't have all the information. I give you a very good trick to be more empathic and to be more calm. Like suppose that this happens, like somebody crosses you, like, like, like this guy on a motorbike, like races past you on the highway, 160 kilometers an hour. When that happens to me, I go like Rrr! Because they're like very unsafe and they're like, yeah, I, I get very aggressive about that. And the thing that helps me is to think like, well, maybe he's on his way to his mom in the hospital who is dying or something like that. That like really immediately shifts my my attitude. I had, it, I had it on the way coming here actually and I, I said like I have to remind myself of my own strategies and I did it and it calmed me down. Of course it's going to be more difficult when they pass you like this, okay? <laughs> so it doesn't always, it doesn't work for everything. And thirdly, remember that empathy works. Remember that guy Daryl Davis with the Ku Klux Klan if, if, if you find it difficult to have empathy, remember that it's also a question of effectiveness, of creating results for animals. Rationality is the third thing. So rationality, there's a lot to be said about it. One recent example of where we were not entirely rational or not entirely evidence-based or scientific was apparently the movie uh, What the Health, which has um, uh, dealt with a lot of criticism of people saying like, well, this is not scientific and this is exaggerated, etc. And it kind of like, to a certain extent, it backfired, even though a lot of people were convinced by the movie. But um, I, I would say one aspect, of, one aspect of being rational is like not to exaggerate vegan claims. And I say like, when, when, you, when, you, when you do that, when you present veganism as the solution for everything in the world, for every problem, you, do, you are a vegalomaniac. Um, so, so let's try to keep it real and let's try to not exaggerate the claims for veganism. But the most important thing that I want to talk under the flag of rationality is um, purity. And I wish there was a day, I wish a day would come when I don't have to address this aspect anymore, but it remains apparently so necessary. And this is the most controversial part of, of what I have to say. So we have these questions and discussions all the time about who is vegan and what is vegan, right? And I want to suggest this. I want to suggest three things. I want to suggest that there are people who are 100 
or 200% vegan. They, they are there. Um, I want to suggest that people who are 99% vegan, who make small exceptions, like very small exceptions, that it's okay that they call themselves vegan. And we shouldn't like question that. I'll explain it in a minute. And I also suggest that there is a thing like 95% vegans, people who are 95% vegan. Let me explain these things. So first of all, vegan, 100% vegan, it's not easy to see what 100% vegan is. Okay, there are by definition almost fuzzy borders. Like if you look at this scale here, it goes from like big ingredients to mi micro ingredients, like, like things that you can't even see. The question is how far are we going there and at what point is somebody vegan, okay? So you could, um, you could say that you're only a vegan if you have studied by heart this little book with 300 pages of possibly non-vegan ingredients. Okay, this is hard to do. I guess nobody is vegan, but somebody could learn the book by heart and say, I'm the true vegan, okay? And so you can have a situation where for every vegan, there's another vegan who is more vegan. And we can all tell each other, you're not vegan, and this person tells the other one, you're not vegan, etc. We can play that game at nauseum, at infinitum. And it's not productive, it's not useful. So let's not do that. Let's not try to be a level five vegan, okay? This is... A distraction. And also you have to know that it's not always that impactful. Okay, so for instance, just a simple example, these people are dumpster diving and maybe they're getting some meat now and then from this dumpster and they're eating it. It has no impact whatsoever on the market, on demand. Okay, and the other way around, being vegan is not enough either. I mean, there's animal suffering and there's environmental problems even, for, for instance, with chocolate, which, is, which can be a vegan product. Okay? A vegan chocolate still requires a lot of water. It can have palm oil, which causes animal suffering. So don't think that as a vegan, as a 110% vegan, you're there. It's not true. Okay? The second concept is that there is something like a 95% vegan. I don't think this is controversial, but I see all the time something like, no, doesn't exist. You either are vegan or you are not. It's like being pregnant. You are pregnant or you're not pregnant. There's nothing in between. I don't think that's a good way to look at things. I think a more useful way is to indeed say like there's something like a 95 or 85% vegan, just like the raw food people do. Oh, her colors are a bit off. I think that's from the raw food. Um, <laughs> um, so um, raw food people, they say these things all the time, like you're a nine, I'm a 90% a raw. You know, uh, and we could say that about being vegan too. And of course, 40% vegan doesn't mean anything anymore, but like, let's say till 80% or something. It is a useful concept, I think. Um, so rather than seeing it like black and white in terms of uh, being pregnant or not, let's see it like maybe like a religion, like in, in the sense that like these people, they're religious Jews and they're very religious and they're following a lot of rules. So they cannot, on the Sabbath, they cannot press an elevator because that's an action and you can't do anything on the Sabbath. So you have to get a special elevator. But, uh, but for instance, Jonathan Safran Foer is also Jewish. He doesn't do these things. He's not so strict, but they're both Jews, right? So it's just a matter of strictness. I think it's useful to see it like that. It's not, to, to not see it as a binary thing. Okay, and the most controversial thing is um, that I would suggest that people who make tiny exceptions, I mean very rarely, that if they call themselves a vegan, we don't go out and say like, well, if you do that, then you're not a vegan. You know, I see that all the time on the internet. If you do this, then, that, then you're not vegan. Veganism is the definition of veganism is that, etc. So let me explain what I mean. For instance, you're going to your grandmother and she made cookies and there's egg in, the, in those cookies or whatever. And you're a person, I don't do this personally, and maybe you don't do this either, but there's vegans who say like, yeah, just for my grandmother, I'm doing this. Once a year that I go there. And maybe you can imagine that this grandmother is like 99 years old and she will die the next year. And yeah, that's why you want to do it and that's why you don't want to disappoint her. Or <clears throat> maybe there's a business meeting and you see that there's like impactful people around you and you know that if you're going to be very, very strict, I'm not saying you should eat like, 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 like a, a slice of cheese or something, but some, some maybe a tiny ingredient you, you may have doubts about, well, that you don't make a scene and don't question. If people do that, I think that's a good thing. And I wouldn't put, push them out of the club for that, okay? So let's look at this, let's, let's go a little bit further. These are your meals in a year. 
That's 1,095 meals. Suppose that one of those meals is not vegan. You see the little dot there? One of those meals is not vegan. And that, that means that there's still potatoes and vegetables and there's maybe like a fish or whatever. So one third of that meal is not vegan, right? So that's 0.03% of your meals is not vegan. Is that enough to say to a person, no, you're not vegan? You don't belong to the club. You cannot call yourself a vegan, even though they are so much more, so much closer to being vegan than to anything else, than to vegetarian or whatever. That would be silly, I think, right? So, of course, there's, there's, I, I understand that people have problems with this, this approach. So you could say, for instance, what if we did this about people? What if we said, like, yeah, well, you can do a little bit wrong with people. You can murder uh, uh, just one person one, once a year or something. Well. <laughs> That's not really comparable, okay? Um, so let me explain you what I'm not worried about here and what I'm worried about. So we, we may have different worries. I'm not worried about my mom forcing things into my throat. Like, you know, when she hears that I'm saying like, well, these tiny exceptions is not too bad. And then my mom says to me like, yeah, I heard you say that. Uh, so this, is, this cake has eggs in it. Now you have to eat it. I just explain, no, mom, I don't do that. You know, I can be still very clear about it. So I'm not, not worried about it. I'm also not worried about confused waiters. You know, people say like, oh, we're going to confuse the people in the restaurant and they're not going to know what to do, etc. We can still explain it. And I think it's much more easy to explain what a vegan dish is than what a vegan is. So I think vegan as an adjective is much more useful, much, more, less, much less problematic than applying the word vegan to a person. When is a person vegan? It's not so simple. When is a dish vegan? It's much more simple. I'm not concerned about watering down veganism. I'm not concerned about veganism becoming something that it's not or that wasn't intended. It's in the end, it's not about veganism. It's not about the system. It's not about the definition or the ideology. It's about the animals that suffer or that don't suffer or that killed or not killed. And I'm also not worried about the 98% vegan world. Do you see my chicken? My chicken uh, thing in there. So, um, I mean, some people say, like, we'll end up with, with something close to, but not quite vegan. But, I mean, if we get to 98%, that, first of all, that would be a wonderful thing. And secondly, if we get there, the remaining 2% will take care of itself. Okay, I see so many people focusing and spending so much time on the final 1% while we're not doing the first 99%. What I am worried about is alienating meat eaters, like by being extreme in all these things. And I'm not saying that veganism, being vegan is extreme or that being a consistent vegan is extreme. I'm, what I'm saying is that sometimes in our communication, we can be extreme. I'm worried about alienating vegans, something I see all the time on the web, people shifting from one Facebook group to another because they can't stand the atmosphere in one Facebook group anymore, and they go to another that they hope is more open and more tolerant until that one becomes wrong too, and they shift to another one. Have you come across that phenomenon online? So, so this is really a bad phenomenon, like that we, that we constantly make our own group smaller and smaller. I'm worried about recidivism. One of the reasons why people drop out is because they find it too difficult. Okay, so we can make it as difficult as we want. We can put the price of admission to our club as high as we want, but it's not good to put it like extremely high. I'm worried about signaling. Like suppose that, um, you, you think you're not a real vegan because you do this or that, and then you're on a, on, a, on a survey or something, you say like, well, I cannot take vegan, I have to take vegetarian because this one time at my grandmother, I did this. Well, then we're signaling that there's less of us than that there really are, I think. And that's not, not a good thing for the economy, for marketing and such. So let's not make a very small group even smaller by being so strict about things. Let's not look, thing, look at things as binary, as black and white. And here's three distinctions that I think are useful. First of all, expectations you have, you can make a difference between the expectations from yourself and the expectations you have from other people. Be as strict as you want, maybe you don't have to expect the same thing from other people. Behavior can be different in private than in public. You could be maybe as strict as you want in, pub in, in private and maybe a little bit more lenient in public, maybe for strategic purposes. Or you could do it the other way around. You could like eat meat in your basement and be very strict <laughs> outside. 
And consistency, make, it, make a distinction between consistency with rules and with the definition of veganism and with goals or results. This is something some of you may have seen before. If you go to a certain city and you have to buy dinner for a friend and you know in that one restaurant in that, one, in that city there's only two choices. A very bad vegan burger and a delicious vegetarian burger. If you're consistent with your rules, you will buy them the, ve the very bad vegan burger. If you're consistent with results and with goals and with output and impact, I think you should put, buy them the vegetarian burger because they will say like, oh my God, this is good. I can taste this again. And there they will say like, oh my God, this is dreadful. Okay. And the final one is positivity. Mainly my message is let's try to be more like dogs. Okay. Optimism is a moral duty. I, I, I believe in that. It's a moral duty because optimism will get us further. It will be more sustainable for us. We will keep doing what we're doing if we have hope. And of course, we don't have to exaggerate it because we cannot be optimistic about everything and sometimes it would be dangerous. Like, we don't have to be naive about Donald here. I mean, it's not, not productive to say like, oh, everything will be all right, okay? I think resisting this is a good thing. Optimism or positivity also towards, uh, you can do it towards other vegans, first of all. Um, and there it's, it's very important, or it's important in general, to realize that you're not a mind reader. To realize that you can never guess other people's intentions, that you don't know why they're doing something. I see people saying things like, you're doing this because of this. Like people say about me, like, you're doing this because of money, or so, as if I ever make money with activism or advocacy. Or, you know, um, so, so this kind of like trying to guess or trying to know what people's intentions or motivations are, I don't think it's a very nice thing to do. We can also be more positive towards non-vegans, and that's very difficult. If we see all this horrible suffering, um, it's hard to be positive. It's hard to be positive towards people like, like a bullfighter. Something that helps me is one quote. It may sound a little bit cheesy, but I like it. Those who deserve love the least need it the most. You understand that? So most of the time, when, some, when we think that a person has done something really bad, we take away all, all the love and the support that we have. We put them in prison. And they're probably the people who can use love and support the most. So we have it backwards, I think. I think we have to remember that we are the first species, and this is a wonderful thing, we are the first species to question our own diet. This is from a movie called La Belle Verte, and it's about aliens like, who look like us from another planet, and they have missions and they go to different planets to, um, to educate people and to help them evolve. And then the time comes when the people there on that other planet ask, like, who is joining me to Earth? And everybody says, no, 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 not to Earth, because Earth is a very primitive planet. And one of the people who comes down to Earth, and she has an influence on everybody she touches. And uh, there's one woman walking into a butchery, and the alien woman, she talks to her and she says, like, what is that? What did you just buy? And the woman says, like, it's my meat. Uh, I just buy it to eat. What, what are you? Are you crazy? And, uh, and a second later, we see her sit down on the pavement and she looks at her meat like this. She takes it out and she looks and she's like, and you see her wondering, what am I doing? That's what part of us are doing for the first time, for the very first time. And you have to see ourselves as we were recently an ape hanging around in trees. Right? And we were doing things, all kind of horrible things. We're still doing horrible things. But today we are modern beings. We have technology since a couple of hundred years. And we have made a lot of progress. And you have to think about the next part that's coming. So much possibility for change for the good, change for the better. I think you have to believe in that. And if all else fails, and if you're still not positive, at night in front of your computer, and you're down with all the horrible things that people do, then you can enter this in Google. Pictures to restore your faith in humanity. And then you see pictures of this guy giving water to a koala, and these guys saving a goat from a stream or from the sea, or 
these officers helping ducks across the street, or this person helping cat, person helping another one's dog out of the water, and this one, my favorite, a fireman handing a cat back to their person. And you see the cat doesn't care much. <laughs> but, but look at the woman. <laughs> look how, look how, how happy she is to have that cat back. Look at the care and the love that you see on that face. And I think that it's very important. I think I, I would like you to think about people like that, about peop people who care about animals, about cats. And I know it's not a pig or a chicken. And I know very well that maybe that very night she had chickens or pigs on her plate. But she cares about that cat. She feels love for an animal. And I think most of us, most people are like that. And that's something to believe in. And that's something we can work with. Thank you very much. I don't know if it's time for questions, just saying um, if, if um, you're interested in my book, they have it at the buyback stand. I'll be happy to sign a copy during the lunch hours. We have a lot of time for questions. Thank you for your talk. I agree with your um, analyze of uh, the use of the word vegan for um, persons. And I think also that we should use it um, for uh, products or dishes, saying uh, these are vegan products, vegan dishes. But um, I am uh, thinking we could even um, uh, stop definitely using the word vegan for uh, humans um, entirely. Like we can say it's just a boycott of animal products and explain to people with whom we talk about animal rights that when they have to choose between a product, uh, between two products, one is vegan, uh, the other one is not, that they have the moral du duty to choose the um, vegan one. So in this way, they will uh, understand that um, it's, um, it's a moral obligation to do it when we have a choice. And, um, and even I think in the future, uh, we could even stop using the word vegan even for products because um, if we want a society where the lives and the interests of animals are respected, all products uh, are entirely plant-based, so we don't need the label vegan or on all products. These are just normal products. So uh, at the end, we will uh, even stop using the word vegan for our products. What do you think about this? Yeah, thanks for your comment. Um, yeah, I agree to, to a high extent. Um, and I think in the future, it could very well be that it becomes the default and we don't need the word and, and some some, it's like in India, sometimes you see non-vegetarian on the restaurants. Uh, so it shows that that's not the default. Um, so, but I think at this point, the word vegan is a useful thing, maybe even for persons, but I just wouldn't like make it so, make not the, the, the price tag so high to be able to call yourself a vegan. Um, I think it's useful because it's an easy way to define um, what you do, what you are, what your expectations are of food. So I think it's, it's handy. Uh, the problem is that it comes with a lot of bad connotations and associations. And I think also we, we are too strict about it. I wouldn't mind, I mean, I see people saying all the time, like, if you do it for health reasons, then you're not a vegan and you're a plant-based diet eater or plant-based dieter or whatever. I, I, I don't think that's, that's a very useful thing. I don't mind when people who do it for health reasons call themselves vegan. It makes our group bigger. We need that. So uh, for, for convenience, and for signaling, I think it's a useful term. I just think we need to like uh, make sure that people associate it with positive things, with good things, with an enlargement of choice, with nice people. Um, that's, I think, what's the most important at this point in time about the word. Ah, okay. <clears throat> so thanks for the talk. Um, I have one question. Um, you had like, um, as far as I understood correctly, you said that all the people here um, are like, 
the low hanging fruit and there were the people um like we had some um i don't know predispositions or whatever um to adopt um this lifestyle this ideology or whatever you want to call it uh, because of some i don't know some predispositions mm -hmm. or whatever and i'm just wondering what led you uh, to the conclusion that uh, like we're in some kind special and the other people aren't well i mean you could almost say like the fact that we are here and the other people are not shows that there's a difference between us and the other people right so what could that difference be i think one of the possibilities is that we are just more open um, maybe to put um, to put our beliefs into practice maybe we're more disciplined maybe we're more empathic um, there, there can be all, maybe I mean there's also differences like maybe we were born or raised in the right environment or we met the right people or we read the right books but I think there might very well be some personality differences um, that are that are important and it is important to take that into account it is important to take into account that the other people are not necessarily not like us and may in fact be very different from us and and just taking that into into account makes you uh, make sure that you won't try to use the same solution for everybody. It's like one size fits only one, you know? Um, so we have to be, I think, adaptive in, our, in how we approach people and we say like, if I talk to you, I can try to see like how you are, what, what are your interests, are you interested in the environment, etc. Uh, maybe you're not into food at all, or maybe you are into food. I can, I can play into that in order to like take you along on that journey, right? So, it's just an important realization to, to know that we are different. It's also important to know that we have a lot in common with each other and that many people care, like the, the woman with the cat, care about animals. So that's also something that we need to, to work with. I want to thank you for your point about rationality. So as a scientist, I'm very much in favor of that. But given your last statement, do you think there is a correlation between the early adopter thing and the fact that we're having a problem with rationality? Can you say it again? Sorry. So the fact that there is a rationality problem, do you think that might be due to the fact that we are early adopters? I think you mean a rationality problem within our movement. I think it has to do, yeah, it has to do with passion also, with the fact that like we so believe in this thing and we are so convinced that we are right about it, that sometimes we get a little bit blinded. We get a little bit blind for some kind of arguments, for being open to other people, for listening to other things. So it, it, that's what I mean with being in the vegan box. It closes us off to a certain extent to hearing more, to listening more, to hearing about arguments, to hearing science. We have very much, we have a very big confirmation bias. We want to hear things that confirm our own ideas because we want to be successful and also we want to be right. We want to be confirmed like everybody else. We want to be confirmed in their own opinion. So I think there's a, there's a lot of things. Um, I think rationality is basically challenged as soon as an ideology shows up. And veganism is basically a kind of ideology, even though it's, I think, a very great and a good ideology. But it may prevent us from hearing everything there is to hear and and reading all the arguments or being open to all the arguments. That's why I emphasize uh, open-mindedness so much. Yeah. Um, I just want to add a question what we can ask carnists or omnivores. Um, how vegan are you? How many percent vegan are you? And then they can think about it and maybe can easily join our club. Yeah, that's a possibility. Or you can ask, like, like, do are you doing something? Like, do you have at least like a vegan day or whatever? Or do you have vegan meals now and then? I'm not saying that everybody. I mean, I'm not saying the vegan label can apply to everybody. You know, like if you eat meat uh, every month or something, then then still. But yeah, uh, but 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 I think, like you say, it's really important to give people the feeling that they can be part of us, and that we don't give them the feeling that like even saying things like. Yeah, you're well on the way, but you're not there yet or something. I think this alienates a lot of people. And that's what the label does, basically. The label is useful, but it's also damaging. There's one over there. Uh, 
Hi, thank you for the speech. Uh, unfortunately, I can't agree with so many things here that I just can't start, and I don't know where to start. Um, but I think I'm going to start with uh, something that Indra showed us yesterday, uh, starting her lecture, with showing us a story about the cow and about the milk products. And I think um, I understand what you mean. I understand the ideology of making it, sorry for saying it, less, more shallow for me, because being vegan, it's something very special. And when you score the point, when you're looking at the milk products and you don't see cheese, it's not exception. It's not exception for me to having a, um, I don't know, anything, a yogurt, a cow's milk, you know, anything of it. It's not exception. When you score the point and you see it, and you see that bleeding cow, dying cow, is not exception. It's not exception to saying somebody that, yeah, you are a vegan, but you know what? You can have it. You can have a whipped cream. You can have something like this. For me, it's just impossible, really. I understand the ideology to having more people to um, uh, do a lot of things, to you know, invite them to eat less and less and less. But honestly and personally, I will never agree to say something to that kind of person that is vegan, because mm -hmm. it's not. For me, yeah. being vegan, it's not about food. And this is the thing that I don't agree with your lecture. OK. So yeah, I mean, I think this is, this is a, a case where, um, I mean, I'm, I'm like you. I won't make these exceptions, except for like, like things that are so small that they're not comparable to a, a slice of cheese. Um, but I think it's, it's useful here to make the distinction between what you do and what you expect, accept, ex, uh, expect of yourself and what you expect of others. And I would just recommend that we do the thing that gets them on board, because if we get them on board, that will mean reduction of suffering for those cows, especially. So um, that's what I'm always looking at, like looking at the impact of what we do. And I understand, I mean, I've been a vegan for 20 years and I understand all the suffering. But there's some things that we do, I think, in our passion and in our care and in our empathy for these creatures that get other people further away from us rather than closer to us. And I think we have to get them closer. And it's not, like I said, it's not that anything goes. It's not like I will call somebody a vegan or I'll even allow them to say that, to, to, that, to say that they're vegan when they're like making like, like, like a lot of exceptions or something. I'm just talking about like this, this, this tiny things that, that we are constantly on people's backs and saying like, you're not there, you don't belong to us, you're not vegan, you can't use that word. I don't think that's a productive attitude at all. I think the people or the, the beings that suffer most because of that attitude are the animals. So we can discuss it later, it's a long discussion. Um, sorry, <laughs> hello. Um, I have heard of that um, many uh, anti-species or some anti-species say that uh, anti-speciesism is a uh, much more preferable term to veganism because um, one, I think one biggest difference between anti-speciesism and veganism is it is entirely possible to ignore wild animal suffering entirely uh, while being vegan. So um, what do you think about the topic uh, of wild animal suffering? and? Uh, I think that using uh, the term anti-speciesism is better for uh, making people to care about uh, and, um, wild animal suffering. Hmm. Yeah, well, first of all, let me say, like, if you, if you compare an anti-speciesist approach to a vegan approach, I think it's very valuable to have other arguments in our arsenal of arguments than moral arguments, ethical arguments. So health arguments, environmental arguments, taste arguments, they're all really important to use in, this, in our campaigning and our outreach and our advocacy. Uh, also because these moral arguments, they often create a lot of resistance with people. People feel less worthy because you are vegan and they are not, and it creates resistance and they will like step away from you. The distance will become bigger, they can avoid you, etc. So. It's not to say avoid moral arguments, but use moral arguments together with the other arguments. That's why I would say like the vegan outreach, which includes environmental health, taste, etc., arguments, is very useful. Then to your um, point of, of wild animal suffering, I do care about the suffering of wild animals. I think um, 
I think that's the, the biggest discovery I made in the last few years. It was like to me, like a moment like that I said, like the same thing as being vegan. Oh my God, I, all these creatures in factory farms suffer. And then you say like, oh my God, all these creatures in the wild, they suffer too, they suffer horribly and there's so many of them. So um, yeah, to that extent, um, I think um, we should start talking about it and an anti-speciesist uh, argument may be, may be a way to do that. On the other hand, I think like it's, of course, this is a very difficult thing. This is maybe a next level thing for later. I think within a context of, of people like these, Stan has a, a talk like about it, I think, right now or, or later today about wild animal suffering. I think it's important to raise awareness, especially within the movement among ourselves. I think talking to a wider audience about it is, um, is not easy, it's quite a challenge. So I would, of course, prioritize and uh, the factory farmed animals also because uh, we are personally responsible for that. Um, but I think it's a very important issue. Thanks for raising it. Um, I would be just um, strategic and careful with it at this moment. Uh, first of all, thank you for your talk. Uh, I found it very interesting. Uh, I just want to give a comment to um, the slide where you showed the two burgers. Um, so you said that it was by rule or by goal. And um, I, I just want to say, so I like the concept. By my personal interpretation of that uh, is a little bit uh, different to yours. Uh, that doesn't mean I disagree with that. But So if I want to go by goal, that is, I wish to have a more respectful world where we respect each other. So that's why I also agree we should have empathy towards bullfighters and hunters. Mm -hmm. um, but um, so that means for a more respectful world, for me, by definition, that is a vegan world. And so when I come into that scenario, I'm not thinking about whether to go with a vegan or vegetarian burger because the question does not arise mm -hmm. for myself. I just think for a more respectful world, veganism is only just the beginning. So we can talk about uh, plastic in the ocean. So we, um, I mean, I try to reduce my plastic consumption vastly. I also only go for, because uh, I, I find it wrong to only care about animal rights and not human rights, or so like for clothing, for instance. So I think it's just just, just the first starting point. I personally think to reach that goal, what can I do further even beyond veganism? So I never think about, so even if that burger doesn't look that great, um, so I'm not, I'm not caring about the people sitting around me judging me or um, I'm not doing it for them. Yeah, if I was doing that for people, that is people that I probably have never seen, that don't have enough to eat. And I'm doing that for so many other reasons, but not because of other people. So I would still go with a vegan burger, even though it doesn't look that attractive. Yeah, because because of the respect, you say? Yeah, exactly. And yeah. so, and so I'm, I, I never think about, do I, do I eat the vegan version or like with a little bit of milk or eggs in it? Because yeah. it's, it's just a given... I yeah. think for me, and then I can look what can I what what can I do beyond that? Yeah. Because I don't think veganism is the answer to everything. I think mm -hmm. it's just one part that affects many different topics. But uh, but I uh, think what what can I what can I even do further? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'm not sure if I understand, but maybe we can discuss it in private uh, afterwards. Thanks. Um, I have a question to to about um, empathy. You were talking about and you gave some examples which I understand, which I can deal with and have empathy with, but you also gave examples for the, the bullfighter or last night we watched the movie The Kangaroo about, I don't know if you have seen it, but it's about um, um, sculling and harvesting, which is a very disgusting word for, for um, killing um, kangaroos in Australia. Um, how far would you go with your empathy, like yeah. where is your, is there a border, is there a line you are pulling or a rope you are pulling yeah. where you say there's enough of empathy, I, I t this is not, there's no discussion point anymore, no understanding anymore. Yeah. For me, it's already a bullfighter I can have empathy with, sorry. Yeah, um, it's but very hard. Yeah. It's hard for me too. Yeah, um, and I think we are, this room is completely overloaded with empathy, yeah. I'm sure, so yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, I'm, empathy does not mean approving of anything. Empathy, I use it in the, in, in, in the way that if we try to have empathy, we're just trying to see where this person comes from. 
and that maybe the bullfighter has been raised in the tradition of this and that maybe he has an inferiority complex and he wants to prove himself or maybe his parents were like drilling this down to him that he had to become, a, maybe he had no, op I mean, there's so many things that you can imagine um, what he's like or how he's like and that can help you if you would talk to this bullfighter, which probably you don't have the chance to, but if you would talk to him, that you would have like new opportunities to like raise something or influence them. That's one thing, it's, it's, it's result oriented. And secondly, it's also, I think, um, it's better for yourself. I mean, if we go through life being angry at these people all the time, I don't know what that does to us in terms of sustainability and in terms of like our peace of mind, um, and in terms of like spreading anger and outrage all around the world, which happens so fast on Facebook. So every time I see something that infuriates me, um, it's not that I will push away that indignation or that anger, but I will try to find something that softens me a little bit so that it becomes more bearable for me and that it might become more effective um, in terms of communication towards them. It doesn't mean approving. And I can perfectly understand that there's people like you cannot have any empathy for. I just experienced that as it developed inside me and as I, had, as I got into the habit of like trying to look at things from their perspective, it, it helped me a lot, both in communication and for my own peace of mind. But it's up to you to find how, how you deal with that. A border. I think it's almost always useful. Um, I mean, and I think I can, I mean, I talked to, I was I visited a prison some time ago and, um, and I talked to a murderer and he, he had killed somebody. And he told me that his nine brothers and sisters were all in prison. I mean, that tells you something. That tells you that it was like a household that was not very functional, right? So. There's always information that you can gather that can help you, like, yeah, have empathy for, I think, almost whoever. Um, so, regarding communication, you mentioned storytelling, that we end up, like, making judgments or thinking about what, why the other person's doing certain things. And um, I was wondering if you know or recommend any tools for effective communication for vegans. Uh, I personally have studied nonviolent communication and I found that very effective in my life. Nonviolent, yes. Especially mm -hmm. re when I talk to non-vegans as well. Um, yeah. But would you think, because we're such a small community, that we should actually actively get involved in learning these skills? Yeah, I think, um, I think it's nonviolent communication is not easy to apply. But, uh, or not easy to consistently apply in all situations, but I find it a very beautiful thing. I think it's, it's one of the things that could make the world a better place if we all learn to, com nobody of us learned to communicate. I mean, maybe you, you took that course, but basically if you graduate at, at, from secondary education, you have not learned to communicate in a way that is productive, that is tolerant, that is empathic. We have not learned that. That will be one of the most important skills, I think, and, and, and we teach that in our SIVA trainings. Melanie talks a lot about that. That's one of the most important skills that we can learn, not just as vegans, but as humans. Uh, so in terms of um, resources, yes, uh, so Marshall Rosenberg and other books on communication, I really recommend that. On my blog, Vegan Strategist, there's a resources section in my book also. There's some, some stuff on communication that I, that I recommend. And it's, um, it's not easy to do, but again, um, it makes you a happier person, a better person, and a more effective person, I think, if you can communicate with empathy. So, thank you a lot. We are out of the time, so have a nice day, and thank you for this beautiful presentation. Thank you.